Hey, welcome back to Antisocial Studies and my series on a brief history of. I'm Emily. Uh, thank you for joining me for the first time, or hopefully you've been following along in the series. Today I want to talk about a brief history of race and racism. And this is such a big topic that I'm going to break it into a few episodes. Uh, so this is the first in what's going to be three episodes all related to this topic. Uh, full disclosure, most of this comes directly from my episode on slavery from season three of my podcast. So if you're interested in this, this is what I'm going to go over in the next three episodes is basically uh, act one of my full episode from season three U.S. history on slavery. Um, but I just figured it was too important just to leave it in the podcast form. I wanted to include it in this series as well. So today we're doing part one, the transatlantic slave trade. Um, and admittedly, I probably should have just started with this topic, right? Because this is the root of all of it, race and racism. But honestly, I was a little scared and I needed to like ease y'all in with some light discussions of slave patrols and police brutality, right? Um, but tackling this can be tricky. This topic gets even some of my most liberal students like a little confused at best and kind of obstinate and frustrated at worst. But like, I've already gone this far, so let's just go. <sighs> okay, here it is, white people. Hmm. Marty, I'm already envisioning the comments that are gonna be streaming into my YouTube. Race is not a thing. It doesn't exist. Okay, societally, we've made it a thing. But scientifically, there's no such thing as race. Ethnicity also isn't a real thing. I know, <laughs> take a deep breath. Basically, race is used to describe someone's physical characteristics. Obviously, they most prominently focus on the color of their skin. And ethnicity is like a helpful category that's used to group people that share common cultural expression and identification. But they're both man-made labels. They don't really exist. There is no significant biological difference between white people and black people. There is effectively no difference, except that some people have more melanin in their skin. And the first humans were in Africa with heavily pigmented skin to protect them from the sun's rays. And so as humans migrated to places further away from the equator, like in Europe and Asia, uh, evolutionarily, they just produced less melanin because their bodies didn't need it anymore. But otherwise, we're basically all the exact same humans. Race is not a thing. Or really what I want us to think about is that race doesn't have to be a thing. But we made it one, and so now we have to deal with it. And to be clear, by we, I mean white people. White Europeans created the concept of race as we know it. Why? To justify racism. Huh? Yeah, like it, this, this is where it gets kind of confusing. It's a little bit of a chicken and the egg sort of thing, but just stick with me for the next few episodes and hopefully I'll make it clear. So. Again, the rest of this episode comes directly from my podcast episode in season three on slavery. You can find it on my YouTube channel, or you can also find it on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. So if you want um, to go beyond these, these next three episodes, please check that out. But for now, let's just figure out why are race and racism a thing? Because they don't have to be, but it's so ingrained in us that it exists that most of us never even consider that there was a point in history when it didn't exist. And now I want to be really clear, right? Like xenophobia is basically as old as civilization, right? I mean, we've always been fearful of others. Uh, the Greeks called foreigners barbaros, which is where we get the label barbarian. Uh, and fun fact, the word actually came supposedly from the Greeks imitating the sound of a foreign language. Bah, 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 barbarian. I don't actually know if that's true, but I've been told it so many times and I really like that story that we're just going to go with it. So it makes sense, right, that when you're in an ancient civilization just trying to grow wheat and appease the gods, that, and you're amongst people that you've known your entire life who look like you, they speak the same language as you, it makes sense that you'd be nervous if a stranger just like walked into your river valley with new customs, clothing, and language. But today and over these next few episodes, I'm not talking about the general us versus them mentality that arose among civilizations, which was sometimes delineated along ethnic lines. In these next three episodes, I'm talking specifically about white versus black racism. That rose up, it's historically documented, during the 16th and 17th centuries, and we've been paying for it ever since. And by we, I mean people of color have been paying for it ever since. So first, oh, here we go. 
a little bit about the transatlantic slave trade. So when the Europeans began looking for a new labor source in their American colonies, they turned to Africa. Why? Well, I address this in a lot more detail in season one of my podcast, so go check out epi episode seven um, of season one for a lot better explanation. But basically, Africa had been a major source of slaves for hundreds of years. They were traded often by powerful African kingdoms to the Islamic caliphates and Arab traders um, who then sold them all around the Arab and Asian world. They were sometimes sent across the Indian Ocean to East and Southeast Asia. But the numbers traded per year, as far as we can tell, were relatively low compared to what's about to happen on the Atlantic Ocean. And the type of slavery was different. Now, I want to be really clear. It was still terrible and it was still slavery. But as we're going to come to see in a second, American style slavery was the worst version of a terrible thing, right? It's the worst version of slavery that we've really seen in world history. So even with a slave trade already functioning in Africa, that slave trade was not a race-based system because again, the concept of race didn't exist. People weren't enslaved because they were black. They were enslaved and a lot of them happened to be black. But we see evidence of enslaved Arabs, Asians, white Europeans. The word slave actually comes from the Middle English sclave, which relates to the Greek sklavos for Slavs. So it's generally believed that the word for slave is directly related to the Slavic people of Eastern Europe, because many of them were sold into slavery around Europe and Asia. So what changed to make slave equal black around 1500 or so? Well, for one, the slave trade just exploded. From the 16th to the 19th centuries, an estimated 12 million Africans were forced onto ships, kidnapped and taken to the New World. New World. At least 1.5 million of those people didn't even make it to the Americas because they died on the ship, euphemistically called the Middle Passage. So now you had exclusively black people serving as enslaved labor, which created this false rationale amongst colonists growing up in that world to believe that slave equaled black. But this wasn't an accident. So let's dive into the worst myth that exists around slavery. And teachers, if you're watching, fair warning, it's probably something you've been saying in your classroom for years. I know I have. <sighs> Quote, after indigenous people died of disease or refused to work, Europeans increasingly turned to enslaved Africans to work on the New World plantations. Already exposed to old world diseases, they were better suited to fulfill the increasing demand for labor in the Americas. Sound familiar? I mean, basically every textbook says something like that. That's how we explain it. Enslaved Africans filled the labor void that Native Americans couldn't fill because they were dead or had run away. And they were better suited because they weren't dying of disease like the natives were. And is that factually correct? Yes. But here's the thing, right? The myth lies in the inevitability of it. The way it's taught in schools, the Europeans had no other option. They needed people to work on their plantations, and the natives kept dying or running away. Ugh, so inconvenient. Yada, yada, yada. They enslaved tens of millions of Africans and their descendants. That's insane. <laughs> there were so many other options. All right, let me walk you through a few. At this point, really, obviously, I'm talking to like 16th century Europeans, but I'm just going to talk to them through you. All right, Europeans, option one. I mean, I would just argue that if your line of work, i.e. cotton farming, requires so much labor that you literally have no other option besides enslaving other human beings, then maybe you should find a different line of work. Or I don't know, just like scale back on your business model. But that's just me. Option two, just pay people to work on your plantation. Like minimum wage doesn't exist yet and you're making enough money to buy nice wigs, ship wine over from France, and oh yeah, buy slaves that were really expensive. You're telling me you can't just use some of that money to instead pay for workers? Ugh, but then you'd have to treat them well enough that they would stay, Ugh, like voluntarily. And I guess that's an issue. But seriously, they did have other labor sources at the time that weren't those two I just mentioned. Most notably, they already had a long history of both indentured servitude and serfdom in Europe. Indentured servitude in this context meant that someone couldn't pay their way to the Americas, so they got a wealthy person to pay their expense and then promised to work off their debt for a set amount of years. Normally like five to seven years, they were essentially enslaved by that person. But then once they'd worked off their debt, they were done. And this is the most common type of slavery all around world history is just debt slavery. Once you work off your debt, you're done. And your children, very importantly, are not in any way brought into that system. So 
This is a decent system for both sides in some ways. The financier got free labor and after the debt was paid, the worker now is in the new world, often able to get their own land for cheap and to start building up their own wealth. So that's option number three. I mean, slightly worse, but better than slavery, Europe had a millennia of experience with serfs. Serfs were laborers who were tied to a piece of land, unable to leave, but they were still viewed and treated as human beings, allowed to work their own plot of land, raise a family, etc., as long as they remained on their lord's land to work the fields. I mean, South Carolina actually set up a system similar to serfdom. They wrote a law in 1686 establishing slaves as freehold property, meaning that they could not be moved or sold. So they were still enslaved, but they were tied to that land, which also meant that they would have been better able to establish roots, a family, and intergenerational connections. But within 10 years, they reversed that decision in, op in favor of option five. So I've explained four solid options that are better than what we came up with. They're not great, but they're better. And what we came up with was horrifying because behind door number five was chattel slavery. Chattel sounds a lot like the word cattle because they share an origin, along with the word capital, meaning wealth. So chattel slavery is when an enslaved person is no longer seen as a human being. They are considered property, similar to a cow. Slaves in general were often referred to as black gold. They weren't even a living, breathing cow. They were a precious metal. About 50 years after being founded, colonies started writing laws that established slaves as property that could be moved, sold, and crucially, whose offspring would also be enslaved. So enslaved Africans were no longer treated or viewed as human beings. As writer Dr. Malefi Kete Asante put it, quote, as you would not consult your dog, you would not consult a chattel slave. As you would not concern yourself with the comfort of a tool, a plow, or a hammer, you would not concern yourself with an enslaved African's comfort. What is chattel is not human in the mind of the enslaver. Quote. And even though there were plenty of laws to regulate the use of enslaved people, in the colonies, the enslaved person had no rights under the law. For example, in the colonies, if a white person murdered an enslaved person, it was a misdemeanor punished by a small fine. Meanwhile, an enslaved person could only attack a white person in defense of his enslaver's life. When I first read that law, I thought, oh, a self-defense law. And then I reread it. No, no, an enslaved person can't attack a white person defending their own life, only if their enslaver's life was in danger. Obviously, there were also laws that prohibited enslaved people from assembling in groups, learning to read or write, destroying crops in protest, or dressing in fabrics above the quality of a slave. Okay, so that's where we're going to pause for today, because that's a lot to take in. But a little bit of a spoiler alert. What we're going to talk about next episode is the invention of whiteness. And just as some foreshadowing, or to kind of give away the ending, right? Whiteness and thus blackness and this idea of different races and some being better than the others is all invented to justify the economic relationship that I just described in chattel slavery. Thanks.